Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. Welcome to uh, Shelby Christian Church. We're excited that you're there worshiping with us online. If you are on Facebook, on our YouTube site, or on the uh, website, our live streaming there, go ahead and just comment today and let us know that you're there. We have some hosts that would love to connect with you today uh, as well. We're excited about what Dave's going to be sharing from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. He's going to be talking to us about what it means uh, to have a prayer life that, that Jesus is teaches us about there in that passage as we walk through that. Uh, we're going to talk about what it looks like to ask and to seek and to knock, to be persistent in our prayer life. And so we know you guys are going to be encouraged with that. Uh, let's begin our time today by just worshiping God. Thanks for being here today.
calm the storm that surrounds me In just one word The darkness has to retreat In just one touch I feel the presence of heaven In just one touch Open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can know. Oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can't do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside. One word, and you revive every dream. It's just one touch, I feel the power of Him. It's just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but Church, at this time, we're going to go into uh, a time of communion. And I think more than ever, uh, sometimes communion can get watered down. It can seem like we're going through the motions, uh, particularly in a church like ours where we go every single Sunday and, and we partake in communion. But I think more than ever, it's come to be something that we uh, appreciate, something that we're maybe looking forward to because it hasn't been taken away from us where 
we are looking for bits and pieces of that everyday normal life that I think we're really starting to crave now as a church, as a society, um, as people who want to be able to connect, who want to be able to come out of our houses in, in isolation. And so at this time, these, these symbols, uh, the bread and the juice, can really take on what they're supposed to take on. The sacrifice, the commitment, the uh, moment in time where a body was broken for us, where we're not always to be isolated, where we're not going to be shut off uh, and distance from our Heavenly Father. And I, I pray that this can sink in, uh, not just to our minds, but also to our hearts and our spirit, that a body was broken, uh, a spirit was, was given, so we can have uh, eternal life, so we can have a personal relationship, so we're never always feeling uh, alone. Also, too, this is a time of, of offering. Uh, right now, you can send in a check or you can uh, have uh, it automatically with, withdrawn from your, your bank account, or you can send a text to 502 200 1152, and there will be information on there on how you can contribute to the church so day to day operations and functions continue to occur.
What's up, church? Wasn't that a great time of being able to sing together, worship together through communion? We're so glad that you're worshiping with us this week. Uh, if you didn't do it earlier, when Jason asked, go ahead right now in the comment bar and let us know where you're worshiping from, how many people are with you, uh, and we've got hosts that can answer questions or, or pray with you, and there's a prayer line, all those things Jason told you about. Thanks for sticking with us through this weird season. Uh, of life that we've been in. And next week, I am convinced, is the beginning of another great new era in the history of the church. Not just Shelby Christian, but the, the big C church, the church of Jesus all around the world. And so uh, at the end of the service, uh, we're going to have a video you can watch. Many of you have already seen it um, by this time about uh, our reopening uh, next Sunday, May the 24th. Here's what I want to challenge you to do, all right? I really want to challenge you to really start praying and asking God to lead you as to what you need to do. Because here's what, I'm 100% confident that if we pray and if we ask God, God, what should I do, that he will lead you specifically that he will lead you specifically, and that if there are issues in your personal life where you don't need to be around anybody, he will lead you in that. Uh, if it's time to come, he will lead you that way too. Here's really what I want to encourage you to do. I want to encourage you to take your lead from God. Uh, don't take your lead from the person next door or even from maybe your spouse uh, or a friend, or somebody on TV, or anyone else. Don't take your lead from them. Take your lead from God, because I am 100% convinced that God will lead you to the right choice and the right decision for you. And like we've been talking about, hey, the beautiful thing is, if he leads you to stay home, we're going to be right there with you next week where we are right now. And so you can worship as God leads you. That's what I want to challenge everybody to do is to let God lead you. And, and I'm 100% confident that he's going to lead some of us in different directions. And that's okay. That's okay. But if you put yourself in his hands, then I know he'll lead you to the right situation. Now, here's also what I want to challenge you to think about a little bit. It's really easy in a time like this to think about, I just want to I just want him to lead me to safety. See, God doesn't always lead us to safety. He just promises us that he'll be there with us. I, I, got, a, um, I, I got a message uh, on Wednesday from a guy that some of you have heard me talk about. He's, he's a friend of mine named Youssef. He pastors a church in Pakistan four years ago. On Easter, his church was bombed and, and uh, 70 people died. And, and I got a message from him on Wednesday that on Wednesday morning of this week, his church was attacked again. Uh, women, 
elderly people, children were abused and, and harmed. Walls were knocked down. The cross was desecrated. And, and I just think about Yusef and how Sunday after Sunday, day after day, week after week, he goes, and along with the worshipers at his church, they go into a situation that every time they go to worship, they know it's not safe. But they believe and trust in a God who is watching over them and who is leading them. So I want to challenge you. Let God lead you. Let God lead you. So today, I've got to ask you a question. I've got to ask you a question, and, and when you get the answer, I want you to type it in, in your comment bar, Okay. And there's a couple obvious answers, but they're wrong, okay? So here, here's the question. What do Britney Spears, Beyonce, Ashley Simpson, and Mariah Carey have in common? What do Britney Spears, Beyonce, Beyonce, Ashley Simpson, and Mariah Carey have in common? Now, if you say they're women, that's one of the obvious wrong answers, okay? If you say that they're uh, singers, that's one of the obvious wrong answers. What do they have in common? Let me give you a couple hints, okay? It, it happened to Britney at many of her concerts. It happened to Beyonce during the national anthem at the inauguration service, the second inauguration service for President Obama. It happened to Ashley Simpson in 2004 on Saturday Night Live. And it happened to Mariah Carey on New Year's Eve in Times Square in 2017. You know the answer? All four of those stars got caught lip syncing. All four of those stars were pretending to sing when they really weren't. Now, probably the most famous situation, and I may date myself a little bit here with the years, but probably the most famous situation of that was when a guy named Robert Pilatus and Frank Moran, those two guys, pretended to sing under the label of Millie Vanilli. Now, here was the deal. They never sang. The, here was the deal, though. There were two guys that did sing, and they were really good singers, but they just didn't look the part. But Robert and Frank, they were dancers and models, and so they had the stage appearance, and so there was this great plot developed where Robert and Frank would come out and pretend to be singing. They looked good. They looked the part. They looked like they were into it, but they were never singing. Finally, the, the gig was up, and they were caught. They'd actually won a Grammy Award, and they had to turn it back in because it was all a hoax. Today, today we're moving into a portion of Luke in this year-long focus on Jesus, and in this mini-series where we're talking about Jesus being the Lord of all. And in this particular part, we're talking about how Jesus is the Lord of prayer. And Jesus' disciples come to him, and they ask him a question. <clears throat> it's in Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. They say, Lord, would you teach us to pray? They saw Jesus praying, and they said, Lord, would you teach us to pray? And so really, really what this is here in this passage, really what's in this passage is the disciples' prayer. But we always call it the Lord's Prayer. You know, the interesting thing about the Lord's Prayer is it's probably the most famous prayer prayer that there is in fact i would guess that if i said right now wherever you are let's pray the lord's prayer together that most of you watching could do the majority of the lord's prayer by memory you can quote it you can get all the way through it you can say the lord's prayer you can tell people you know the lord's prayer but here's something that's going to shock you the lord never prayed this because see this wasn't a prayer this was a teaching on prayer and so he said, when you pray, do it like this. And he points to some very specific things as a guide to our prayer life. This first 13 verses, Jesus points his disciples, and he points us, because we're his disciples. Those of us who claim to be Christ followers today <clears throat> are disciples of Jesus. And so we, when we claim that, we we inherit the same teaching that the disciples inherited. And in these 13 verses, Jesus teaches them about the greatness of God, about the giving nature of God, 
And then he finally summarizes it by painting a picture that teaches them that there's a God who hears and grants our request. So let's dig in. Here at the very beginning, it's all about the greatness of God. Like I said, like I said, the disciples, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, would you teach us to pray as John taught his disciples? And so Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. You see, in that verse 2, in those, those three short phrases, Jesus is pointing them back to the greatness of the Father. See, he begins with the person of prayer. In fact, as Jesus teaches in this passage, what you'll see, he begins and ends this pointing people to the Father, pointing people to his heavenly Father. Now, we are instructed... We are instructed in Scripture to pray in Jesus' name, to to go to God through Jesus, to allow him to be the intercessor of the Holy Spirit, to take these requests to the Father, but we don't pray to Jesus. We pray, pray through Jesus. We don't pray to Mary. We don't pray to anybody. We pray to our Creator, to our Heavenly Father. And so Jesus starts off here pointing them to the person of the prayer. Now, Jesus doesn't refer to God as his friend, as his master, as the king. He doesn't refer to him as the big guy, the man upstairs, any of those things. He refers to him as Father, Abba. It really comes from a word that is of of high character. It's of an enduring term that he's just saying, this is not just talking to anybody. You are talking, communicating with your creator, the one who loves you most and loves you best. And so he says, if you want to pray, here's how you pray. Start off by calling him Father thinking of him as a loving father. And then as he continues talking about the greatness of God, he talks about the purity of the prayer. Not just father, but look what he says. Father, hallowed be your name. Now, hallowed's not a word that I hardly ever use except when I'm in this section of scripture. I can't even think of the last time I used that word in everyday language. So What's that really all about? It comes from a a Greek word that literally means to set apart as holy. To set apart as holy. Do you believe that when you pray that you're talking to a holy God? That this is not just some casual lip sync conversation, but that you are talking to a holy God? And if you don't, then, then why are you praying? It, it, is your prayer life hope or is it confidence? Are you just hoping that there's someone out there that hears? Or are you confident in a holy God that loves and hears? See, knowing who God is gives us confidence in God. You know, what we do when we worship And when we pray, it is a holy offering to a holy God. So Jesus points them to the person of the prayer. And he points them to the purity that there needs to be in their prayer. But he also points them to the purpose of the prayer. He says, your kingdom come. Now, in Matthew's gospel, when he records this particular event, he gives a little bit more verbiage. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A lot of scholars believe that Luke recorded only the first three words, your kingdom come, because Luke felt like that when God's kingdom came, that then his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he was looking to that. You see, either way, the purpose of our prayers is to bring heaven to earth, to bring the will of God into our everyday life and what God's desire and God's hope and his purpose to bring God's will into reality. You know, I, I've got to be honest, there's times I've been guilty that my prayer life was a lot like my Christmas list. 
It, it was that list of things that I really wanted. It, it was my will that I was asking God to, to grant and to bring to me. And, and it really, really had very little to do with what God wanted. But Jesus is teaching the disciples, then and now us, to pray with a purpose, to pray to a father, an endearing father, to pray with purity to a holy God, and to pray with the purpose of bringing God's will into existence in our daily life. So, so, so Luke starts off this section, and it teaches to pray. He says, all right, let me tell you about the greatness of God. When you pray, here's how you start. And then he talks about the giving nature of God. Look in your text there. It says in verse 3, Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. I want you to notice that Jesus encourages the disciples to ask for God's provision. That was a common theme in Scripture. James, in James 4, 3, talks about that you don't have because you don't ask. The psalmist in Psalm 37 said that God wants to know the desires of our heart. You see, the first part of this, the first part of this section in verse 2, there's three things that talk about the high and mighty God. God, who He is. The second the second section here talks about a practical and a personal God that relates to and cares about what's going on in our life. And so Jesus here starts listing some things. He says, give us our daily bread. It's the provision of the prayer. Now, once again, if you go back and look in Matthew's gospel, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus goes through a dialogue and talking about the things that we worry about in our everyday life, what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to wear, where we're going to sleep, all those things. And at the end of that, at the end of that discourse, Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God. And all these other things, they'll be taken care of. Seek God first, and you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat. You don't have to worry about what you're going to wear. You don't have to worry about a pandemic. You just seek God, and he'll take care of it. Do you believe in that holy God? Do you believe in a holy God that provides and is the God of provision? See, to pray for our daily bread, it's kind of like in, in the wilderness. In fact, I think Jesus here is referring to the time when God's people were in the wilderness, and God blessed them with manna each day. It was their daily bread. And, and to pray for our daily bread is to gratefully acknowledge that God is the source of everything. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. The second part of this section where Jesus teaches the disciples about the giving nature of God, he encourages them to not only ask for their daily bread, but to ask for forgiveness for their sins. He says, forgive our sins. It's the pardon of the prayer. Just like the daily bread was the provision, the forgiveness is the pardon of the prayer. Just like our physical bodies need food to survive, you see, our souls need forgiveness to survive for eternity. And I hope that you're beginning to see that this is not just some simple rhetoric type of prayer that we can lip sync our way through. We're into deep stuff now. We're talking about our own sins. See, a lot of times if we're not careful, we get to this part in a prayer and we just want to throw the blanket statement of, oh, God, forgive me all my sins. And there's a time and place where God wants you to get specific he wants you to deal with what you know your sins really are and spoiler alert he already knows but he wants to know do you understand what you're really being asked you're asking to be forgiven of are, are you in a place where you understand when you're stepping outside of my will and jesus says come to the father and ask for pardon the forgiveness of sins it's part of moving heaven to earth 
Then the final part of this giving nature of God, Jesus refers them to the protection of the prayer. He says, lead us not into temptation. That's what you should pray. Ask God to lead you not into temptation or to protect you from temptation. Now, be very careful because the Bible tells us that God would not do that, but that he would protect us from temptation anything that could tempt us see tests and trials and temptations they're part of life We're, we all go that jesus went through that right after his baptism he goes off into the wilderness and he's tempted by satan we all have temptations he wasn't saying we should ask god to remove all those from our lives those are things that sometimes god takes us through sees us through and he uses those times to mold us and shape our lives I'm convinced right now, gang, I'm convinced right now that while by no means did God cause this pandemic, but he's working in it. He's working in it. And he's using situations to mold us and to shape us more into the image that he wants us to live in. James wrote in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect. Did you catch that That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So what Jesus is saying is, God wants you to have the very best. And sometimes we stray off course. It's through those trials and through the temptations that we get brought back in to where he really wants us to be. That perfect relationship with him. The, the prayer we pray is asking God not to allow those tests and temptations to overwhelm or overpower us, but to help see us through those things paul said in first corinthians chapter 10 that we have the promise from scripture that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man because god is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it so jesus as he teaches the disciples to pray he has these two sections he points to the greatness of God, and he points to the giving nature of God. But there's a few more verses we want to run through kind of quickly here. And just like in the parable of the sower, where Jesus told the parable, and he kind of explained, but then he came back and kind of re retold it and explained it. Well, Jesus comes back behind this teaching on prayer, and he gives an illustration to help the people understand it. In verse 5, it says, Now, which one of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, don't bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Now understand culture here. Understand culture. Jesus is describing a situation where everybody's in bed. And it's not like in our house where the kids are in this room in bed and the, and the other kids are in this room in bed and, and we're in our room and we can get up and go to the door. No, in that culture, it's a small house and a lot of times everybody's sleeping in one room and to get up you have to climb over everybody and everything. Jesus said that's not really practical. But then look at verse 8. He said, I tell you though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is... Uh, he is his friend, yet because of his impotence, because he won't give up, because he keeps on asking, the finally the, the friend will get up and say, okay, here. And then he says this, I tell you, ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. Because what father among you, if his son, if his son asks for a fish, who are we? Sons and daughters of God, children of God. Which one of you if is a, a father, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more 
will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? See, Jesus tells this story to illustrate what's going on. A little bit later in, in our study this year, and we get to Luke 18, we'll read a story about a widow who's persistent in coming to the king and just keeps coming to the king and keeps coming to the king. And she just keeps coming to the king and coming to the king. And finally the king says, here! And he grants her wish just to kind of get her to be quiet. And then Jesus, in that teaching, says, how much more so will a God who loves you grant your persistent request not to shut you up but because he loves you and so we get in verses 9 and 10 here and we've got those three big things ask seek and knock ask because he hears your cries seek because he'll come to your aid knock because he'll answer the door but here's the catch guys and this is critical. you got to get this. This is not a blank check. This is, a, this is not a live however you want to live. And in that moment of need, kind of name it, claim it, blab it, grab it type of deal. That's not what this is. This is, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus says, you got to understand the greatness, the awesomeness of God. And you've got to understand how much, how much of a giving nature God has. And then through this last part, he explains a God who hears and grants our request. See, Jesus already said that prayer is about God's will, it's about God's kingdom, and it's about God's glory. Guys, the bottom line is we've got this incredible privilege of talking to God anytime. How cool is that? Is that we have a God that wants to hear from us and that we can talk to him anytime, any place we want, and he's given us everything we need so his will can be accomplished in our lives. Without that power, let's be sure that we don't do it on our own. Let, let's really be sure to take away from this that we're not going to lip sync our prayers anymore. We're not going to lip sync our conversation with a holy God anymore. And, and, and if, that's, if that's what you've been doing, if that's what you realize you've been doing, maybe today's the day that maybe for the first time ever, you need to pray the most sincere, heartfelt, fall on your knees before that holy God kind of prayer and ask him to really come into your life. How about we do that right now? God, I just pray that as we've talked about this teaching from Jesus, that, that God, that your son came to, to be the one to pay the price for our sins, that it's your forgiving nature, and Jesus came and he paid the price, and in this particular day, he was teaching the disciples and teaching us how to pray. God, help us to understand your greatness and understand your giving nature. And God, my, my prayer right now is that if there are those that are praying and asking you to come into their heart for the very first time, that you will open the door, because I know you say you will, and, and that you will be part of their life. And so God, I pray that people are praying that prayer right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. There's a little bit more worship to come and a video at the very end, but here's the deal. If you prayed a prayer just now, really asking God into your life, maybe for the first time, would you send us a message on one of those comment bars there? Or would you use the prayer line and to call or text a message so that somebody can walk through that whole deal with you and congratulate you and encourage you and set up a time uh, for you to surrender and baptism? And we'll just uh, we'll look forward to that. Uh, but right now, let's continue to worship together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name 
Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Show me who you 
Hey, thanks for worshiping with us today. We hope you guys have been blessed and encouraged by our service. Um, you're going to see a video at the end of the service today. It's just an explanation for uh, next weekend, May the 24th. We're going to be live uh, here on the campus. And so Dave's uh, put together a video. So make sure you watch that explaining exactly what's going on next weekend. Uh, we're excited about being back together. And so we hope th that you will be uh, preparing for that as well, praying about that too. Uh, thanks for being here today. Have a great week and we'll see you next time. Hey guys, it's the day that a lot of us have been waiting for. We're ready to let you know about the reopening of the Hill. We will be having in-person worship starting May the 24th. Our plan is to have our normal worship times of 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. We will have two venues. We will have worship in the main auditorium and we'll also have a family service in the gymnasium. The family service uh, will be set up especially for parents who are bringing children. There will be children's activity pages already packaged uh, with sheets and crayons and all things like that. They will be packaged with gloves, masks, sanitary, so that will be the only thing that you will have to touch when you go in there with the exception of your communion cup but individual families will have their own table over in the gym. So you and your family can come in, sit at an assigned table. The tables will be social distance from one another, but that way we will have something for the children because we're not having children's programming uh, as it normally was for several weeks yet. And so we'll have the family service in the gym and then the normal worship time in the uh, auditorium, once again at 8.30 at 10 and 11.30. We will ask you to register for each of those services. There will be a form and there will be a link that will show up on the bottom of this video where you can uh, type in and go to that form online and register your family or you can call the church office at 633-5975. Uh, let the secretaries know which service you want to come to, which hour, which venue, and how many people will be there and they'll register you that way. And then that way we can know how many people it helps us control the population number of each room. It also gives us names of who's in each room in case there was a, a problem or down the road somebody tested positive that we could let people know. But we're, it's just a safety precaution, but it also helps us uh, with organizing and making sure we've got the right numbers. The, the guidelines we've been given is 33% of the fire marshal capacity in each room. Trust me, we are going to be way below that. In fact, we're going to be closer to the 25 to 27% capacity range. That's if we pack it out completely. So three services, we're going to have roughly space for 400 people between the two venues uh, at each hour. And so we know we're in great shape on that. Here's what we're going to ask you to do. When you register, if you're going to a service in the gym, we're going to ask you to park in the front parking lot. If you're going to the service that's in the main auditorium, we're going to ask you to park in the back parking lot. Certain parts of the building are going to be locked off. Uh, they're going to be pipe and draped off. In fact, we've already got the pipe and drape up to block off certain portions of the building. Uh, in each room, seats will be kind of designated. You can sit here, you can't sit here. And that way we'll accomplish social distancing all the way around. We have hand sanitizer by the gallons. Uh, we will have hand sanitizing stations inside of each entrance uh, as well as other bottles throughout the building that you can use. Water fountains have been shut off. We, we think that's a, a dangerous place for people to be drinking out of water fountains. So no water fountains, but we'll have bottled water uh, at, each of the, at each of the venues uh, in case somebody does need a drink. Restrooms will be on a limited availability. First of all, the service is only going to be 45 minutes. We're going to design the service to where it's only 45 minutes long. So hopefully you can kind of take care of restroom issues before you get here. Uh, but restrooms will be only on a limited basis and only a certain number of people in each restroom at each time. Uh, we will clean the entire place between services. That's one of the reasons we're going 45 minutes. That gives us 45 minutes to wipe down everything. Uh, that could have possibly been used in the previous service. And we will have hand sanitizer, mask for anyone who wants a mask that does not have one. If you want one, we've ordered 500 and we've got uh, some other cloth ones already here. So we've kind of tried to think through every issue that's out there. 
and be prepared. Our hope would be that you can park in the parking lot and literally walk in and out of the service and the only thing that you would need to touch the whole time would be your individually prepared communion that you just reach down and grab your cup and it's been prepared with gloves, masks, sanitized situation. And so it will be wonderful. You won't have to touch anything. Doors will be propped open. You literally can walk in, grab your cup, sit down, go through the worship experience, drop your cup in the trash on the way out and go back to your car, not having touched anything else. The only exception being in the children's areas, if parents would need to pick up the Ziploc bag for your children and help them with that. Once again, a lot of sanitation involved in preparing those. We are going to give you more details probably again next week as we get closer. But for now, we just want to let you know we're excited to get back together on the 24th. But we also realize not everybody's ready for that. And we understand. So rest assured, all of the platforms that we have been using to be a church online for the last eight weeks, they're all still going to be there. You'll be able to watch us on the website. You'll be able to watch us on Facebook and on YouTube, on Roku and on Apple. Uh, we are posting to Instagram Live after the fact or Instagram TV after the fact. So there's going to be plenty of ways to worship if you're not comfortable coming to the facility yet. We will also have our drive up communion outside. Uh, several people have mentioned they, they really like doing that, but they're just not ready to come inside. And so Brett and his team will have a communion station outside doors four, five, and six, just like we've had every week uh, of this whole uh, season of life that we're in. So as I said, we're going to come back to you almost on a weekly basis and give you updates that'll be posted on the website, Facebook, all of our, all of our avenues of doing that, just to let you know what's going on. But for today, we just wanted to give you kind of the 60,000 foot flyover. We're getting back together on the 24th and those three services, it's gonna be awesome. We are going to crazy lengths to make sure everything's clean. And so if you've been out and about and you're ready to come back, we want you to feel like you can come back into a safe environment and to be able to worship together. And we look forward to the day when we'll all be able to get back and do that. Thanks for staying with us through all this. Thanks for checking in. You can catch me every night on Facebook at eight o'clock uh, for the Daily Dave, and we'll be giving uh, updates on a daily basis. We'll do something like this on a weekly basis. We just wanna stay in touch with you, stay connected with you, and we wanna get you engaged and what God is doing here at Shelby Christian Church. Looking forward to seeing you on the Hill on May 24th.